All right, uh, let's get started. <coughs> That's not a good sign. So, how's morale? I was so. It's post Thanksgiving. It should be high. Um, today, my morale is low actually because I'm a little under the weather. I have a sore throat. Um, don't I don't need sympathy, but. Uh, <laughs> I might cough in the middle of lecture, and I, I am losing my voice. So I'm going to try to speak a little softer. Uh, so I, I uh, apologize for that. Um, so today we're going to talk about ethnic politics. So continuing with, with this idea of contestation from below. So last week, uh, we got a, an opportunity here from Leda Hong Fincher and talking about the feminist movement. This week, we're really going to focus on ethnicity and religion. And again, the, the goal is to give you a sense of the major groups um, that are viewed as threatening by the Chinese Communist Party that potentially threaten the regime, uh, and then the way that the Communist Party tries to manage those groups. And so we learned a little bit firsthand um, from Dr. Hong Fincher, and today we're going to talk about ethnic politics focusing on Xinjiang. Uh, and then on Thursday, we're going to get a guest lecture from Harry uh, drawing on his dissertation research about Christianity. Um, so before we get into Xinjiang, um, I wanted to start briefly by just highlighting um, some takeaways from Leda Hong Fincher, and I, will, I want to apologize. So a few of you emailed me and asked if there was going to be a video available uh, from her talk with us last week. Uh, and unfortunately, for whatever reason, the talk wasn't videotaped. So I apologize. It, is, it is, uh, not, was not recorded. But she did give a public talk for our China Center, which there is a video available. So I can send you that um, if you're interested in seeing what she had to say. Um, but for me, these are the, the kind of the four big takeaways from her talk, the things that really stayed with me and, and that, that things that I that kind of changed the way I was thinking about China. Um, the first, the thing I want you to come away with most importantly is this idea of, of authoritarianism in China being particularly patriarchal. Um, and so we've long talked about authoritarianism in China and the, and the various strategies of the CCP. I think what Dr. Hong Fincher's work, one of the, the key contributions is that we should also be thinking about this in terms of gender lines and, in some sense, how the system is built upon uh, a, <coughs> a system of the oppression of women um, and how women are placed, um, despite this myth, not necessarily a myth, um, and she did a nice job of talking to us about employment statistics under Mao, uh, but this idea that the party is the liberator of women and the party is responsible for giving women a place in society certainly today seems to be overblown and, and in fact, overstates uh, how, um, uh, overlooks, I should say, um, various forms of, of misogyny and sexism within the Chinese system. Um, another key kind of theoretical takeaway, which I think you might have uh, noticed as well, um, is that repression, we've, we're talking a little bit more about repression in the last couple of weeks, repression can backfire, right? And so we see the regime um, really overreacting to a very small scale protest. Remember the, the Beijing Five, the Feminist Five, uh, were simply advocating for better legislation about domestic violence. Um, and in detaining them and doing so without cause or without uh, legal justification, not only did they galvanize the feminist movement within China, they galvanized the global feminist movement and the five women became global icons overnight. Um, and so in some sense, the party in, in engaging in this form of repression actually made the feminist movement. And so that's some, another takeaway. And we can think about other movements we've studied, particularly the, the lawyers, the Wei Chuan movement, and how that, that logic might apply there as well. Um, another thing that I, I, I really took away from Dr. Hong Fincher's talk was this, um, this discussion of, of reproduction and, and reproductive rights and how it's always been inherently linked to the goals of the Communist Party. And so women's bodies are in some sense viewed as vessels for the nation. Um, and the, the most fundamental right, the right to control your reproductive decisions, um, has been violated in different directions at the part, by the party in different times. So during the one-child policy era, uh, we see um, real intrusions into the right, right to reproduce, so people literally not being allowed to have more than one child. And now, because there's a lack of, of births and a low birth rate, we see excessive encouragement to reproduce. Um, and so women, are, are viewed, their reproductive decisions are viewed as, as part of the nation, national strategy, which is, I think, something she brought out. Um, finally, I thought it was interesting, we, uh, we had this sort of discussion about what does feminism mean, nu quen ru yi, this sort of concept. Um, and I, I thought what was interesting is that she hammered home this idea that often the ideology um, 
as, of, of any, any ideology that is not the parties is viewed as hostile and painted as hostile and foreign. And so the idea that women are equal to men, this sort of controversial idea that women are equal to men, is viewed as hostile uh, and Western. And so I, I thought that was a, just an interesting idea and, and attempts to paint these women as, as not Chinese, um, not abiding by Chinese cultural norms, I thought was, was interesting. So I, ho I hope you enjoyed her talk. I really did. It was a highlight of the semester for me. If you like her work, what's the best thing you can do? Be to buy her book. Uh, seriously, I mean, she, she's an author, and it's, it's, she invested a lot in that research, and we're better off for it. So her book is called Betraying Big Brother. Uh, you can find it um, in, in, at Labyrinth, actually, or, or online. Um, other quick things on, on logistics. Uh, so I sent out an email over the weekend of a holiday weekend, which is a horrible thing to do to you all. But the response papers are due. Um, and I haven't looked, but they were due last night. So if you haven't turned in one by now, unfortunately, you have a zero. Um, and I, I'm not going to change that, because I did give you fair warning. I think almost all of you turned them in. Um, but you have two more opportunities next week and the week after. So just keep on top of it. Um, unfortunately, a zero is, is a big deal. It will, will really impact your grade. Um, a couple of you have approached me with per personal circumstances, and I'm happy to, to honor those if there are things going on. But um, again, this is sign at crunch time for response papers. If you're unclear and you're, you're worried about your performance, make an appointment with your preceptors. They're here to, here to help. Um, finally, other quick logistical things. Um, I wanted to do a quick plug for Princeton and Asia. Have any, how many people here have heard of Princeton and Asia? All right, all right, so you don't need a plug. Um, but many of you are underclassmen um, and trying to figure out what to do for the summer. And PIA's summer internships are a great opportunity. Um, this is actually what I did when I was in uh, a summer, uh, not a summer, when I, was, when I was here as an undergrad. Uh, and I helped start a program called Summer of Service, uh, which is an internship program in rural China, kind of like OA goes to China, basically. So um, it's a cool program. It's, it's still around. It's doing pretty well. So I encourage you, if you're interested in getting to China or Asia this summer, this is a cool organization. So just look up Princeton Asia. Um, all right. So today what I wanted to do is, before I get into the Xinjiang issue, uh, I wanted to just kind of give you a brief overview of, of ethnicity in China, um, how, it's, how, how it is and how it's depicted by the government, and then the strategies the government uses to think about ethnicity in general. And then we're going to talk about the Xinjiang issue in particular. And in terms of things, we talked about focusing on current events. In terms of things to focus on in, in your current events, Xinjiang is in the news all the time right now. And so this is a real, a major issue. I'm embarrassed that it's taken us this long to really bring it up. Uh, but hopefully moving forward, you can monitor the news about Xinjiang. <clears throat> all right, so ethnicity in China. Um, so China, it's, it's interesting. So ethnicity in China is in some sense an issue that's lurking beneath the surface. Um, and so in terms of salience, I would say ethnicity in China does not have the salience uh, that racial or ethnic politics in the United States do, uh, for example. But at the same time, it, I say it's lurking beneath the surface in the sense that there is latent ethnic tension in China. Uh, and certainly for certain ethnic groups, um, there are real concerns and animosities between the dominant majority, which are known as Han people, um, and ethnic minorities. So there are technically 55 different ethnic groups in China. These are recognized ethnic groups. And some of these categories, this was done by the Communist Party. It basically decided what ethnic groups counted and which ones didn't. When they did this, they actually lumped together a lot of smaller, smaller groups um, at times. And so they made people into one ethnicity. You know, certain villages would say they're their own ethnicity or, or something like this. But they actually kind of amalgamated a bunch of smaller identities. Um, <clears throat> they comprised collectively 8 to 9% of the population. Um, and there's variation geographically into where they are located, stemming from various, usually dynastic uh, powers in, in Chinese history. But they tend to be clustered in the northeast, the west, and the southwestern parts of China. So actually, the poorest parts of China are disproportionately dominated by ethnic minorities. Um, and the minorities will often be close to the kind of the bordering countries. So the Korean population um, is borders, the, as you would expect, uh, the Korean peninsula. Mongolian population is in Inner Mongolia, Tibetan population, and so forth. Um, much of these areas, if you remember back to our lecture on formal institutions, which was, I think, probably the most boring lecture for you all. But if you'll remember, 
a lot of these ethnic regions are actually not considered provinces, they're considered autonomous regions. And so one thing that the party does, one thing that the Chinese government does, is to try to <coughs> give at least a, some semblance or some nominal autonomy to ethnic groups as a way to promote unity. Um, and so these are special regions, they are, they are not technically provinces and they have some distinctions as a result. Um, Another thing to keep in mind is that um, ethnicity in China is sometimes, sometimes easily observed and sometimes not. So depending on the ethnicity and the person, um, that ethnic marker uh, may or may not exist, right? So some people do not visibly look different. Han Chinese is the, is the majority. Some people, it's not easy to discern if they are Han Chinese or not. Uh, and some ethnic mi minorities are quite distinct and they have distinct cultural garb. Uh, some have distinct religious values, like Tibetans or, or Uyghurs, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, and some do um, speak different languages and, and have different sorts of different levels of assimilation. So, in some sense, talking about ethnic minorities as one thing is a little bit too simplistic, and we should be talking about some of these groups uh, specifically. So that's why I wanted to spend some time. I'm not going to have a chance to talk about Tibet, um, but I, I chose to talk about Xinjiang today because I think it's the, the more pressing issue at the moment. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that there, I said ethnicity sort of lurks in the background. Um, there is concern in both directions. And so ethnic minorities in China are granted certain rights that the majority is not, Han Chinese are not. Um, but um, there are concern among minority groups that the Han population is maybe a little bit condescending or, or excessively dominated. This is sometimes referred to as Han chauvinism. Uh, so this idea that the Han culture is the dominant culture. And we're going to see that play out in Xinjiang, uh, where the Chinese government for decades now has been trying to encourage Han people to move into that region to basically dilute the Uyghur population. And so whenever you're seeing that sort of forced merging of people and, and, a, and a forced intrusion of the majority population into a minority area, that's always uh, a recipe for tension. Um, so we've talked in this class, <coughs> uh-oh, give me a moment. <clears throat> um, so we've talked in this class about this sort of theoretical framework, and I, and I don't want to um, go into it again in too much detail, but when I think about ethnicity in China, I think that the government, it's a clear example of how the government is using all four of these strategies in tandem. So there's a mix of repression, redistribution, and responsiveness, co-optation and manipulation. Um, and so uh, I'll go over co-optation briefly because it's actually something we haven't talked about. So co-optation, remember, is simply the act of bringing members of a group into the ruling coalition. And in so doing, giving them a vested interest in the success of the regime, and by extension, hopefully giving that population some sense of buy-in to the system. So by granting people some power, you keep them at bay. That's the simplest way, simplest way to put it. And so we certainly see this uh, with ethnic minorities uh, in various forms. So remember, we talked about the National People's Congress. Ethnic minorities are actually overrepresented in China's National People's Congress as they are throughout the People's Congress system. Every single ethnic minority is granted representation in proportion to population in the NPC. Um, and when they attend the NPC, they are required uh, at least on the first day, it is custom for them to wear ethnic dress. Why is this done? Well, uh, it is a photo op. It is a way for the government to show the co-optation, to visibly show that ethnic minorities are represented in the system and look they're happy. Um, and I don't mean to be, to be glib or flippant about this, but this is, this is the political purpose it serves. Um, Again, we see this reflected in the numbers. So this is that chart I showed you before that we stared at for a little bit. Um, ethnic minorities, I believe it's in here. Um, there are 170, oh, excuse me, 404 deputies in the NPC. 13% of the NPC are ethnic minorities, compared with only about 8.5% of the population. So there's actually an overrepresentation of minorities in the political system. Um, again, we see sort of similar, <coughs> similar quota systems in place throughout the various party structures. So this is a little bit dated now, but the numbers, I think, have stayed roughly the same. This is membership of minorities in the Central Committee and the Alternative Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. So remember, we have the Palpro Standing Committee, 
Politburo, Central Committee. So the kind of the third level of importance of the Communist Party. Again, we see something hovering around 10% representation in that body, and that's up over time. Um, so they have been trying to encourage more representation. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that representation doesn't necessarily mean power. And one might argue that a lot of the representation that's granted to minority groups in China is symbolic uh, and actually amounts to, to nothing really substantial. Uh, so there are no minorities in the Politburo Standing Committee. Um, and I believe there haven't been for some time. I would have to look. That's a response paper. Someone wants to float that out. I, don't, I haven't done the research, but I, I'm, I'm fairly certain there are no minorities in, in the Politburo Standing Committee. And even the Politburo I'd have to look into. Um, but what we see in elsewhere in the political system is that a lot of the major positions, so these are people that are leadership, uh, leadership positions in the Chinese Communist Party um, who are ethnic minority backgrounds. And what we see is a lot of them are clustered uh, in kind of less important jobs. They're high up in the system, but they're not at the real top. So for example, a vice governor position, uh, depending on how you count, is the third or fourth most important person in a province. The most important person being a party secretary of a province. Uh, <laughs> then the provincial governor um, would be probably number two. Um, but we see a lot of people who are ethnic minorities make it relatively high levels, but not all the way to the top. And so that's another question to be thinking about. Well, why aren't they given real power? Uh, why are they given kind of symbolic power? That's something to be, to, to maybe mull over in a, in a response paper. Um, there are parts of China's constitution. So remember, we have, um, so I, that's co-optation. Another thing to, to be thinking about is that the Chinese government does try to I don't want to gloss over this or romanticize this, but I do think that there is some genuine attempt to foster a low level of autonomy in some of these regions, in some of them, not all of them, and also grant some sort of responsiveness in the system. And so we see this in a number of ways. So in uh, an autonomous region, the chairman or the head of any, any autonomous county should be of that minority. Um, right, so if you're going to be head of Xinjiang, if you're going to be chairman of the autonomous region, head of Xinjiang, you should be Uyghur. Um, but note that this job, these are the government jobs. Uh, the party secretary position, which is the party job for each locality, is often not the minority. Um, but nevertheless, so they do try to grant some, some representation for these groups. Um, also in the Constitution, and if you want to go back and look at the Constitution, you'll see that there's a lot of language in there that protect on paper, on paper, uh, autonomy and the cultural protection of different minority groups. So the organs of, of self-government in the national autonomous area, areas are independently administering educational, scientific, cultural, and public health and physical cultural affairs and sift through the cultural heritage of the nationalities and will work for a vigorous development of their cultures. So on paper, these administrative units are supposed to protect local culture. And they should use the language of that people. So many of the, for those of you who speak Chinese, um, it's sort of a rude awakening when you go to China, right? So you go, you learn Chinese here, you go to Beijing, you're OK. Then you go to the Southwest, and you're like, oh man, they don't say H. And then you go to a minority area, and they're speaking actually literally different languages or, or dialects that you don't fully understand. So many of the minority groups, <coughs> not only are they not speaking standard Mandarin, they're actually speaking distinct languages. Um, and so often when you travel to these areas, you will see government buildings, you'll see Chinese characters, and then you'll see uh, minority written language uh, below. So they're technically supposed to be using local languages in schools and elsewhere. Um, and then finally, another thing to keep in mind is that the government, uh, on paper again, is committed to providing material and financial assistance to these areas. Um, and so it is, this is sort of the carrot. Um, if you comply with the state, if you want to be part of, of greater China, if you want to be part of China, we're going to give you some financial incentives. Um, we see this in terms of redistribution. We see this also manifest itself 
um, in concrete policies. So I haven't talked much about the one child policy in some sense because it's becoming less relevant. But again, this is a policy introduced under Dung to current popu curb population growth. Um, and it, according on paper, the, the policy was that you could have only one child, but there would be exceptions. And one exception was granted to minority groups. And so minority groups historically have been allowed to have two or more children. And this has actually increased over time the proportion of the population. Uh, what you see now, actually, I think Dr. Honvincher mentioned it briefly, is the government is trying to encourage births again because it's realizing it doesn't have enough uh, young, young people in the labor force, um, but that there's a concern that ethnic minority groups constitute low quality people, low quality births. Um, so there's, there's always a tension. But again, on paper, um, there's a commitment to allowing minorities to have greater reproductive rights. Um, finally, so that's redistribution, and we can go over other examples of this. Um, for example, minority students, um, I believe this is still the case, are given a slight point advantage on, on the Gaokao. Um, so maybe there's a slight edge in, in university admissions for, for students of minority backgrounds. Um, another feature of the system, so we've talked about cohabitation, redistribution. Another feature is, of course, manipulation. And again, that's censorship propaganda. I would say I don't have too much time to get into this because I want to talk about Xinjiang. Um, the overarching theme uh, is that ethnic minorities in China are part of Chinese society uh, and they are content. And it's sort of a harmonious system where all ethnic groups are, are working together and living harmoniously. And so we see this. Typically, there will be a, a, a gala on, on China, the eve of Chinese New Year, uh, and there will be performances. Often they will feature minority groups. Um, Imagery used in, in official documents will be things, this is, I like this image. So there are 55 minority groups, but why is there the number 56? Han, right. So these are the 56 different minority groups physically represented, all, uh, all, um, all working together. So that's one dominant narrative, is that the society is harmonious. Uh, but the other narrative, which I, didn't, I don't have a slide for, but something to keep in mind, is that certain minority groups um, are problematic and dangerous. Um, in particular, the Uyghur population, which is Muslim, uh, is often depicted as inherently unstable. Uh, at best, they are depicted as petty thieves. Most Han Chinese are, are, have some version of racism towards Uyghurs. Uh, they view them as lower class, potentially petty thieves, and at worst, terrorist extremists. And so that narrative uh, is used to justify more repressive policies. And so the government, I would say, uses generally this, this depiction of minorities as happy uh, when it's trying to justify more inclusive policies and maybe trumps up um, certain narratives about certain minority groups when it's trying to justify repression. So I, I have about 20 minutes left. I want to talk briefly about Xinjiang. So Xinjiang, I should say that on a personal note. You don't care about my personal feelings, but <laughs> here we are. Uh, <laughs> I started the sentence, so we might as well finish it. Um, so it's interesting. So for me personally, um, I think you know, my views on China are always evolving, and I'm, I'm trying to learn new things. But I have long been, I, I've, I would consider myself someone who, in general, is more pro-engagement with the Chinese Communist Party, meaning I believe that this is a government that is, is can listen to reason and is something that the United States government should be working with. And the, the best, path, best path forward for the US and China is one of engagement and cooperation, not hostility and conflict. That would be my overarching view. I will say, this last 12 months, um, I have noticed in my own views, I've become a little bit more hawkish. Um, and maybe hawkish is the wrong word, but I've become a lot more critical and frankly quite disturbed by some of the things that are going on in China. And these are not new things, but they are an exacerbation of a trend that has been continuing for some time. And so in, in China in the last year, we've seen a major authoritarian turn under Xi Jinping, fostering of a cult of personality under Xi Jinping, the erosion of power sharing institutions, the enhancement of repression techniques, and then this, uh, the Xinjiang crisis, where we have seen, just to give you the teaser, which I'm sure you all know at this point, we've seen upwards of one million 
ethnic minorities thrown in detention centers. We can call them concentration camps. They do fit that definition. Um, for a reason, no, no other than that they are practicing Muslims. Uh, so if that doesn't get you angry and upset, I don't know what will. Um, and this is a government, a lot of very smart people in China believe that this is a correct, humane policy decision. And so it's hard not to get upset and worked up about this. Um, and I find myself, it's hard for me to argue that we should be engaging with China or working with China uh, when the government is committing these sorts of abuses. So this is the, probably the most heinous human rights abuse in China we've seen, arguably since Tiananmen. It's arguably more heinous than what happened during Tiananmen. Uh, you could argue that the repression of the Falun Gong was on this level, but this is massive. Uh, this is a massive human rights abuse, upwards of a million people. We don't know the precise number, but we know that hundreds of thousands of people, at least, are being detained without real cause. Um, and so that's something that I want you to take away. I want you to think about it. Uh, and we can talk about, if you, if you are upset, which I hope you are, um, we can talk about what you can do personally to try to, to think about this issue. Uh, so. That was my personal note, and I haven't even really talked about it yet. Um, so let me give you a brief overview of Xinjiang. So Xinjiang is one of these autonomous regions. It's called the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, sometimes called XUAR. Uh, Uyghurs are the plurality population. They are not the majority, but they are the most, the largest population group in Xinjiang. Uh, they comprise, they think, like 44% of the population. Han Chinese compromise about 42%. So Uyghurs are slightly the majority. That number has changed over time because the Chinese government has pushed Han Chinese to settle into Xinjiang. The other populations are Kazakh Muslims uh, and other minority groups. Um, Xinjiang uh, is home to the Muslim population of China, the largest Muslim population in China. Uyghurs maintain a distinct cultural tradition. They are Turkish Muslim, and they speak a separate language and have Muslim culture. Many of them are practicing Muslims. They pray five times a day and so forth. Um, strategically, Xinjiang does carry national importance to China. So Mao consolidated control over Xinjiang in 1949. He sent his troops uh, to Xinjiang. Um, today, Xinjiang is important really for two, three reasons. Number one, uh, if you locate, just look geographically, this is basically the gateway to the West. So we know that Xi Jinping has an interest in connecting China with Central Asia uh, and the Middle East through the so-called One Belt, One Road. All of that. The railroads and the trade routes flow through Xinjiang. So stability in Xinjiang carries strategic weight. Xinjiang also has uh, natural resources, in particular has oil endowments. And so for an economy that needs natural resources, this is particularly important. And then finally, it carries a certain impor importance because it is a source of instability. So I don't want to gloss over that. Um, so much of the repression that's being done today is done in the name of anti-terrorism. And it's important to be truthful that there are terrorist attacks being committed uh, in Xinjiang by, by members of the Uyghur population. There is a separatist movement, sometimes referred to as ETIM, but now referred to as the Turkestan Islamic Movement, TIM. Um, we don't really know how large it is, but they have claimed credit for a few terrorist attacks, including a terrorist attack in 2013 in Beijing, where a man drove a car into a, crowded, a, group, a crowd in front of, of Mao's portrait in Tiananmen Square. Uh, there were also ethnic riots in 2009 in Urumqi, which is the capital of Xinjiang, where there was ethnic viol violence on ethnic grounds between Han and Uyghur, and Uyghur uh, Chinese, um, resulting in the deaths, I believe, of a couple hundred uh, people. And so it's important to remember that there is instability in the region. The simple argument I would encourage you to take away is that, of course, it is not the majority of the population that's involved in this, right? Uh, and so what we're seeing in, in Xinjiang today is what we would call indiscriminate repression, where repression is being conducted on people who might not really be guilty of anything uh, in the name of trying to squelch out any extremism or anything like this. And so there is a terrorism problem, uh, but the way that it's being resolved is, is indiscriminate uh, and is targeting people who are completely innocent, who are normal people. What exactly is happening? Um, I wanted to show you some videos, but I... I Apparently, the sound isn't working. Um, so I can do the voiceover myself, <laughs> including all the subtitles. Um, we'll see. If it doesn't work, I can just skip it. Um, 
But what, what's particularly compelling and worrisome about Xinjiang is that the, the degree of repression uh, is really unlike anything we've really ever seen in human history. And I, I don't think I'm being hyperbolic when I say that. Um, the government is using a combination of tools and tactics that I think are correctly described as totalitarian. So remember, we've talked about in precept this distinction between authoritarianism and totalitarianism. Totalitarianism is simply an augmented form of authoritarianism where the government is trying to control all aspects of life. Um, and so the level of control over life, everyday life in Xinjiang has reached what I think are totalitarian levels. And I, I'm not, that's not, I'm not, I didn't invent the use of that term. This is just, I, people have used it and I actually don't think it's, it's out of line. So there's really four different tools that are being used at once. The first is what we would call high-tech surveillance, so the use of, of AI and big data to try to track people. The second is detention and re-education. The third is an enhanced security presence. And the fourth is human surveillance and profiling. So I want to talk about each one in detail. Let's see if we, how are we doing? Yeah, all right, let's see if there's sound. Yeah, look at that. All right, so this is from the, Right, just, oh, unfortunate. Hold on. No, well, it's too good to be true, wasn't it? Come back. Well, that's gone. Oh, there we go. Reporting in Xinjiang, in China's far northwest, feels like traveling in a war zone. So we're here in Urumqi, which is the capital of Xinjiang, in a market downtown. The security here is incredibly tight. There are armored cars on the street, police stations on every corner, and tons of surveillance cameras. In the past year, police have stepped up security. The region is now under what's probably the most intense government surveillance in the world. Here. China is experimenting with futuristic spying technologies. For years, China has tried to suppress a separatist movement made up of Uyghurs, a local ethnic group. Authorities say the separatists are Islamic terrorists. We came to see what life looks like in a place where your every move can be monitored. To be in Xinjiang means being checked every day, multiple times a day. When you go to a market, when you drive a car, when you take a train, even your smartphone is checked. As reporters, we were stopped dozens of times by police in just a few days. Our interviews were interrupted. We were detained and chased out of town. Daily life can be exhausting even for people who approve of the security, like this wine shop owner we met. ID cards loaded with personal details are used to track people's movements. Residents have different levels of freedom based on factors like ethnicity and religious practices. Goods that are deemed dangerous are tightly controlled. If you want to buy a knife in this cutlery shop, for example, the purchase is tied to your ID, as this salesman demonstrates. The system also tracks faces. An immense network of security cameras, some equipped with facial recognition, is constantly monitoring the streets. Facial recognition systems are also used to match people with their ID cards, everywhere from shopping malls to gas stations. Authorities use artificial intelligence that can alert them if someone in a video is walking too fast or parked in the wrong spot. The government has also massively increased human surveillance. It has recruited six times more policemen this year than it did in 2015. Cities are now dotted with brand new police booths, one every couple hundred yards in some Uyghur neighborhoods.
for Tahir Ham. All right, so we'll stop there. Um, so just to, just to talk a little bit about, about what we saw. So that was a reporting, I think, done last spring uh, by Josh Chin, who's a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Um, that sort of reporting is much more difficult to do now, given the increased sensitivity of the situation. But um, I think I, I wanted to show you that because it allows you to see both the, the physical presence, um, what it means to actually live in Xinjiang on a day to day, but also this high tech surveillance. And I should say that this is the part uh, that is particularly dystopian and, and particularly sinister to me. Uh, what do we know about high tech surveillance in China? We know that their government has plans to have 400 million closed circuit televisions, 400 million closed circuit televisions throughout China. Um, and that married with facial recognition software uh, and big data will allow them to track the movement of every single Chinese citizen in any public space. Uh, that's what's happening in Xinjiang now. In some sense, this is a laboratory for this use of this technique. It will happen within the rest of China within the next few years, would be my guess. And I don't, I'm not going out on a limb to say that. And so we're at the point where we see in Xinjiang where the government has effectively full information on people. It's tracking their irises uh, of their eyes. It has their DNA evidence. It has ID card evidence. It has checkpoints on them all the time. I don't think the checkpoints and that sort of security, the physical security, will trans transform to the rest of China. But the digital security is a tool that will be uh, used in, I think, the rest of China. Um, so that's high-tech surveillance and the security presence. Um, what's also quite alarming is the increased use of human surveillance. And what we've learned in the last six months is that the Chinese government um, is using Han people uh, to spy on Uyghur populations um, by cohabitating with them. Um, so there's roughly, uh, according to official government programs, there are roughly one million people who are Han Chinese who are being deployed to go live with Uyghur households for short periods of time. They usually refer to themselves as uncle or aunt or big brother, big sister. Big brother, yeah, that was ironic. Um, but um, what are they doing when they're there? They're doing a combination of things. They are taught, they are told to uh, encourage Uyghur population to be good citizens. They're trying to teach them about the, the merits of the Chinese Communist Party and encourage them to have um, so-called correct thoughts, uh, but they're also monitoring them. And so we have a lot of first-hand accounts trickling out from Uyghurs now um, who have had these people in their homes. Um, and the entire time they're there, uh, the Uyghur families sometimes welcome them in with open arms, but at other times they seem to be concerned that they're going to be reported on. And this system, I have a video on this, um, which I might skip um, based in the interest of time. Uh, but this is just a video of some of these home visits from the Uyghur, from Han Chinese. Um, this system is then used to feed into detentions. And so uh, Human Rights Watch recently released a report based on 60 interviews of Uyghurs, um, either outside of China or who had left China or some within China. Um, and they came out with a report, I think it was the 48 reasons you get thrown into a detention center. Um, and this is just some of a list. And basically, if you look closely at this list, I'm not going to go through each one, but you'll see that there are some things here that could be markers of maybe being a participant in, in some terrorist organization. So if you've been abroad, um, that's considered a mark of sensitivity. Um, but most of these markers have to do with practicing Islam, wearing a beard, not drinking alcohol, not eating pork. Uh, so if you practice Islam, uh, you could potentially be deemed sensitive. And often uh, people are actually rated on a specific scale and they are either deemed unsafe or safe. Um, and if, depending on what you do and how focused you are on your faith, uh, you can be deemed unsafe. This is real. I'm not, I'm not making this up. And I think some of you will have the question of um, how do we know what we know, right? So am I just... How do we know that this is all going on? And I will say that the information coming out of Xinjiang is, is hard to get, right? Because the government has closed off most foreign journalism. It's banned the few foreign journalists that have been able to get access. So much of what we know is coming from firsthand accounts, uh, people who are overseas Uyghur talking about what they've heard from their families. Um, 
It's also coming from satellite data and other things. So it's coming from a triangulation of sources. Um, but I personally believe that much of this is, is authentic and real because we've seen it be coming from so many different directions. So it's hard to verify an individual account. In fact, it's impossible to verify an individual account. But we have so many accounts coming out now. You can look at reports by Human Rights Watch and other organizations um, that are all saying roughly the same thing. So this human surveillance system, and I should say that just the, the intrusion of having the ethnic majority come live in your home to educate you on how to be a good citizen, I mean, it would be the equivalent of the American government sending white people to live with African Americans in their homes for short periods of time to tell them how to be better citizens. That is what we're talking about here. And can you imagine that? And so it, the Chinese government pictures this as, oh, these are a way for the, the Uyghurs to learn from the Han population. It's extremely paternalistic. Um, and in some sense, we can call this forced assimilation, forced cultural assimilation. So then the final way that this comes together um, is through detention and re-education. And so we know um, from a variety of different pieces of evidence, this is not just journalists or academics. This has now been officially reported by the UN that anywhere in the territory of, of 600,000 to 2 million people have been detained without cause in Xinjiang. Uh, we can see the detention centers from the sky. So that, a lot of these numbers, so it kind of feels a little bit about how we used to talk about the Great Leap Forward. We don't know the precise number. The government is not releasing a number. So we're engaging in some triangulation. There have been two main sources of data. The first is satellite data. Um, so you can see detention centers. We know what they look like. Um, you can see the construction. You can even see the barbed wire. There's actually a undergraduate I believe he's an undergraduate. He might be a master's student. His name is Sean Zhang. He currently lives in Canada. Um, he, so he's roughly your age. And he's taken it upon himself to identify detention centers using Google Earth and other satellite imagery. And so he's actually been a main force for identifying the scale, scale and scope of the problem. Another mistake by the Chinese government is that they, um, they posted information on public contracts. Uh, calling for contractors to construct detention centers. And that information was public. Um, and so uh, a researcher by the name of Adrian Zenz uh, scraped those, downloaded them, and analyzed them. And from that, we know how many centers they are constructing. And we know how large they are, roughly how many people fit in them. The fact that they need to keep constructing more indicates that maybe they're close to capacity. So that's where these numbers are coming from. Um, are these concentration camps? Uh, often we use concentration camp, we think of the Holocaust, we think of genocide. Um, actually, the formal definition of the term is an internment center for political prisoners or members of a national minority group who are confined for regions of state security, usually by executive decree. Persons are placed in such camps often on the basis of identification with a particular group rather than as individuals without benefit of a fair trial. So that strictly applies. We can, maybe that's a response paper you can write. To me, uh, that definition applies to what we're seeing in Xinjiang. What exactly is going on in the camps? Uh, we don't know. We have very few images. This is one of the images that we do have. Uh, there are some videos being taken. Uh, what do we know about what's going on in the camps? It seems to be a mix of activity. And I should say that there is evidence that educational activities are going on. So the way that this is being depicted by the Chinese government is that this is just training. We're trying to help these people. Uh, develop and get better scales. And so we're providing them with language training in Mandarin and so forth. So there is some truth to that. There's also uh, a video that was put forth on CCTV by the Chinese government a few weeks ago that showed Uyghurs playing ping pong, dancing, generally having a normal life in the camps. And so it's important to know that there is some, quote, normal activity going on in the camps. The important thing for me uh, is that if you can't leave, it is not, you know, that, that's what's most important. It's a prison. If you cannot leave, if you cannot come and go, I don't care if people are receiving skills if they're not free to come. Most educational centers don't have barbed wire surrounding them. Um, and so the Uyghur firsthand accounts, in addition to the training and all, and all of the so-called positive things that are happening, we know that there is evidence that there are massive indoctrination campaigns. People are being forced to sing red songs and praise the Communist Party for hours on end during the day, a forced indoctrination, similar to what would happen in the early days of the Chinese Communist Party. 
There are struggle sessions where people are forced to recount their own errors uh, and maybe even call out some of their relatives. There is some evidence that there is torture being committed. We know that many of these people are being detained just like that. You wake up and you're taken from your family and they have no contact with their families. Uh, their kids uh, occasionally have been shifted to orphanages or schools outside of Xinjiang. There's, there's different school systems being set up for them. Often the entire family will be removed and they will leave one relative behind to take care of nine or ten kids of all that family. And so children are being abandoned or being taken care of by not their parents. <coughs> and very few people have been let out. So that's one of the things. So this, this has really been ramped up in the last six to eight months. We actually don't have that many people, evidence of that many people leaving the camps. Um, and they're not being detained for a crime. They're just being trained indefinitely. Uh, I want to close by just talking about how does the Chinese government think about this? Um, so the government denied their existence uh, for a few months until the international evidence became so obvious um, that they were forced to acknowledge their existence. They prefer not to use the term re-education camp. They prefer, prefer to use the term vocational training center. Um, and within China, these centers are being depicted as happy, positive places to help Uyghurs. So my sense, and again, I hate to, to say I know what the Chinese population is thinking, but my guess would be that most Chinese citizens do not know about what is going on, or if they do know about what is going on, they think it is a good thing or are not aware of the repressive aspects of this. This is the Twitter account of Hu Xijin, who is the um, editor of Global Times, uh, which is a propaganda outlet. So he is, he is not the Chinese government, but he is a voice within the Chinese political system who is quite loud. Uh, and some of his arguments, I think, are indicative of how the Chinese government is thinking about this. I, I believe there are smart people at the top of the Communist Party that genuinely believe that this is OK and that this is the right way to resolve the Xinjiang problem. Xinjiang is trying to eradicate extremism through peaceful. First of all, Xinjiang is trying to eradicate peaceful. So the province is trying, the, the autonomous region itself is trying to solve this issue. Uh, it's weird to think about agency. Just the, 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 the language there is strange. Launch another anti-terrorism war or do it through peaceful education. That's how it's being depicted. Um, another common trope is that these are safe centers where people are happy. Western media report that they were secretly taken away and disappeared. In fact, all of them call and meet with their families. Some can go home on weekends. Some can go home on weekends. The center provides them a place where they can safely rid themselves of lives hijacked by extreme thoughts. Sorry, I'm having trouble hiding my cynicism. Personally, I think there should be an order of priority as follows. Xinjiang's peace and stability and people's life safety should come first. Then other individual rights in Xinjiang should be defended. Third, ethnic culture should be protected. So it was a very clear hierarchy. I, I just, I, the way it's stated here is that clearly peace and stability are placed above individual rights, which are then placed above ethnic preservation. Um, so this is obviously a massive human rights abuse. Um, I'm out of time. I did want to close by talking just briefly about what can you do. Um, I think the, the thing that you should do, whether or not you're a Chinese citizen, is you just need to be aware of the issue uh, and talk about it with people. Most Americans aren't aware that this is going on. And this is something that I think each one of us can make a contribution to just by raising a little bit of awareness. And so I'm part of something called the Xinjiang Initiative which is a group of scholars that agree to speak out about Xinjiang whenever we get the opportunity. So if you are interested in this issue, if you believe it's a concern, I would encourage you to just talk about it with your family, with your friends, uh, and just promote awareness. So I'll leave it there. Uh, and on Thursday, we're going to have a guest lecture on Christianity.